Lord this evening. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles up to the ninth chapter of the book of Mark. The ninth chapter of the book of Mark. There, there is no outline on the back this, this evening, so uh, you, you're fortunate to be able to look at the uh, backdrop of Sarah and Chapel in Pentecost Church uh, for the rest of the service until the next hymn. Amen. And uh, But I hope, I hope you have your Bibles with you. If you don't, grab your one there in the pew. But we're going to be in Mark chapter 9. When you get there in Mark chapter 9, I'm going to ask you to kindly stand one more time. I don't think our knees are loosened up enough, maybe. And uh, I know some of us may be a bit stiff today. But we need to stand as we honor the reading of the Word of God. I want to bring a thought to you tonight from Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Some people say, well, I'm looking for the meaning of life. Uh, some people say, I'm looking for the solution of the world. Some people say that I'm looking for the answer to all the world's problems and uh, for all the years, I remember in the, in the beauty pageants in, in the States, all these beauty pageants they would have, and one of the reigning questions when the, the, the lady was asked, uh, uh, what does she wish for? And she wished for world peace, right? World peace amongst everybody. That was kind of the, the going question for probably a couple or a few decades. And, uh, and that's, always, that's kind of funny when you think about it. We all want world peace. And, uh, but in reality, we have the answer to the world's problems. We have the answer to the world's problems both here uh, and the world to come. And they're all found in the Holy Scripture. They're found in the Word of God. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at Mark chapter 9, and we're going to see some sureties this evening. But we're going to see something else that even, even, is even greater, from the smallest things in our life to the greatest things in our life and everything in between. Mark chapter 9, begin reading with me in verse 13. And you may say, wait a second, that's at the end of another context, and we're going into another. And that's precisely what we're doing uh, tonight. Mark chapter 9, verse 13, the Bible says, But I say unto you, that Elias has indeed come, and they, shall have, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed. As it, is, it is, as it is written of him. I had to take these glasses off. They're rubbish and uh, they messed me up. And when he had came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? One of the multitude answered him, or answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. Wheresoever he taketh him and teareth him, he teareth him and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And he answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it? ago since this came unto him and he said of a child and oftentimes they have cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him but if thou canst do anything have compassion on us and help us Jesus said unto him if thou canst believe all things are possible to him that believeth and straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people, saw the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying, Come unto, uh, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity again. And we do pray a special blessing upon the reading of thy word, dear God. And I pray that our hearts, Lord, would be focused tonight, that we would have a sober mind, that our thoughts and all of our attentions will be collected upon what has been read tonight in your Holy Scriptures. I pray, dear God, that the schedules of tomorrow or that which may have happened in the weeks past would not be a distraction inside of our heart and mind tonight, but that we would be able to fully give attention to what you would have us to learn. Father, personally, I ask you, Lord God, to step and help tonight. I pray that you remove me out of the way and that by full authority, take the word of God tonight and apply it to all those that are listening. Father, I am just a failed man, and I pray that a holy God tonight would intervene in our life. Lord, make a difference in the lives of those that shall hear. In Jesus Christ's name, we do ask all of these things. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for the long standing. 
in honor and reading the Word of God, we find in the 13th verse, in verse 13, we find the closing of an answer that the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is referencing to a question from verse 11. Verse 11, the question comes about, and they said, uh, and they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must first come? So Jesus Christ answers that question, and that answer to that question is the six month elder's cousin of Jesus Christ, who is John the Baptist. When Jesus says, uh, Thou have done whatever thou listed, basically, you've done whatever you wanted to them. We know that John the Baptist, by this point in time, was beheaded uh, by Herod, is commanded for him to be beheaded uh, at the uh, deception, if you will. Um, of uh, or Agrippa, I should say, the deception, if you will, of Heroditus, his wife, or false wife, if you will. So we know that, that we've had this tragedy happen. We know that Jesus Christ, in this point in time in our Scriptures, is walking down the side of the mountain. He's following this wonderful event on the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus Christ is, a, is revealed of what He's going to look like in glory. And Moses and Elijah standing by His side on this mountain. This wonderful event that occurs with, all, with, 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 with uh, Peter, James, and John present for that uh, that that uh, that opportunity for that opportune time, and then he walks down the hill, and I want you to get this picture with me tonight. He walks down the hill and he looks. There's a gathering, all these people together, and they're bickering, they're murmuring, they're they're going back and forth one with another, and one is saying this and one is saying that, and the Lord just comes up to them and and he sees this situation. He wants to know what's going on. In verse 14, he says, when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioned them, and straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and ran to him, saluted him. So this situation is almost diffused for just a second when the attention was brought away from the disciples and unto Jesus Christ. Now, before we get into the whole context of the scripture and the context of the message tonight, that's really where we need to be this evening. The, the, listen, the, 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 the attention and, and the vision and the sight and all of that needs to be taken off of the disciples and it needs to be put on to Christ. And all that we do and all that we say and everywhere that we go, it's not us that needs to be seen. It's not us that needs to be known. It's not my name, your name. It's not even the name of the local church. It is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that needs to be seen in everything that we do. Amen. Amen. Oh, Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. When he says all things, he's speaking of that he's learned to be a base, he's learned to be full, he's learned to be rich, he's learned to be poor, he's learned to be hungry, he's learned to be an unhungry or full. He's learned to live in all ways. He said, I can do all of those things through Christ. He doesn't mean that he can jump off of a, a ten-story building and live. He doesn't mean that if he flapped his arms up hard enough that he would fly. He doesn't mean that if he fought strong enough he can make a book rise and all that crazy talk that's being taught in the world today. When Paul says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, it means that I can live the way that God has chosen me to live, where He's chosen me to live, how He's chosen me to live, in whatever calling He's given me, I can do those things through Him. Beloved, we find the same scenario right here when they take their attention off the disciples. If I can give you one foundational uh, uh, in, instruction or, or, or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Introductional thought tonight is that the attention must come off of us and it must go onto the Savior. Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, a great and wonderful uh, historic event that occurred. The revelation of Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses in the book of Revelation, are, is really given to us that day. The proclamation that John would not die until he sees the Son of Man coming uh, in his glory, which we know that John would see him coming in his glory. How would he see him? He wasn't, he wasn't going to die physically. He was going to see him in the Revelation, amen. In about AD 96, after every one of the other apostles had died, John was the final one living on the Isle of Patmos and the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ was given unto him to pen and the conclusion of the Holy Word of God. Amen. And that proclamation, that prophecy was given that day. It was fulfilled the latter part of the first century. We know this to be true. All of this just transpired and what happens? Jesus Christ comes down. And in these days and in the power that the apostles was given, one of the simplest things that they could do was to cast out a foul spirit. One of the easiest things that could have been done was to remove the spirit from him. It was only one. I say that jokingly a bit, just a bit tongue in cheek. And yet we find that he could not. 
But I must say, I, I must say that the attention had to be taken off the disciples. I guess the reigning thought tonight that if we are going to gather something, it has to be taken off of the disciples. Friend, the attention needs to be put on you. Amen. Let, let, me, let me take a little bit of liberty on this tonight. I'm, I'm shooting from the hip just a wee bit. And whatever I do or wherever I go, in reality, who needs to be seen? Is it me? Is it, is it, am I representing my wife and my family? When I'm, I mean, I am, but who needs to be seen? Jesus Christ needs to be seen. I, I, I like, a, I, I'm, an old, I'm an old cartoon guy. I like the old cartoons. I'm sure uh, most people do. Amen. Uh, some people don't, but I do. Amen. My poor, my dad knows he doesn't like cartoons and always likes Superman. Amen. And I always liked that part. It didn't matter which one it was, the old black and whites or the ones from the 70s or the ones today. But I always liked when he took that suit and he pulled it like that and he revealed that S. Remember that part? I always loved that. And there goes the S. Now you know it's on. Amen. You know, Lex Luthor shows up or Zod shows up or one of those criminals show up and old Clark Kent steps out of that phone. He, pull, he pulls that jack and now it's on. Amen. So the enemy's going to get beat. We, hey, I love that scene, but I think about this in our life. That's what we need to do. We, I, the suit of self needs to come off and the suit of the Savior needs to be seen on this world. And that's the event as Christ comes down this mountain here. All the bickering, all the problems, all the troubles, all the issues that were going on, they all soon turn. And now they're focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now even though they're accusing the disciples, the attention is now on Him. You know what He is, guys? He's our solve. He's our problem solve. He's our, he's our situation uh, secure, if you will. He's our Savior tonight, amen. Without Him, a man cannot be saved. Without Him, a woman cannot be saved. Without Him, a boy cannot be saved. You say, what do you mean saved? Saved for all eternity. Saved from the sin that we are born with. Oh, preacher, I'm not a sinner. I, I do all I do good things. The Bible says all of sin comes short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Every one of us born into this life needs a Savior and God has given us one in His precious Son. And His Son walks down from the Mount of Transfiguration finding His disciples being berated for an act that they didn't do. The first thing that I want you to take close attention to here tonight is I want you to see that we find a sure problem. A sure problem. We've already read verse 14, but we'll read it again just to gather the context once more. And it says that when He came to His disciples... He saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. Skip down to verse 16. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. So here is the center of this problem. Here is the center of this question. Here is the center of this whole situation. Why the disciples of the Lord who were given the power to cast out devils, to give the power to heal other things, to give the power to do other things, why were they unable to cast out this dumb spirit from the child? Now this is a problem, I'm going to tell you. It's not that there's a problem that has presented itself, but the problem is not so much right now of the child with the deaf spirit. The, the, the problem right now is in the fact that the disciples could do nothing about it. This is a problem. This is a problem that presents itself in a way to cause possible doubt among the people. Now, beloved, we do that. We see that many times. We can't live a perfect life. You and I can't live a perfect life because we don't live in a perfect world. We are not perfect people. However, we have a perfect Savior. Having a perfect Savior, we can understand that if we live the way God wants us to live by His book that He's given us, amen, and allow our life to be prioritized. I mentioned that this morning about having our life prioritized. Amen. Our life should be prioritized. I believe in a balance in our life. I don't believe that the pendulum in life should be swung all the way over here. Nor do I believe it needs to be swung over here. The balance is not a balance between sin and, and good. That's not what it is. The balance is living a life to where the Lord Jesus Christ has your priority in these days. There's a sure problem here with the disciples because they couldn't do what God had commanded them to do. They could not do or did not do uh, what the Lord has enabled them to do. So there's a problem, and the problem does not lie in the Lord. But look at the second thing I want you to see real quick. There, there's a problem with the disciples, a sure problem. But here's the issue of the son possessed. 
There's an issue of a son possessed. Look at verse 18 with me. The Bible says, And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him. Now this is the Father uh, telling the Lord what is going on. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, he foameth, and he gnasheth with his teeth, and he pineth away. And, and I spake to thy disciples uh, that they should cast him out, and they could not. And he answered him and said, O faithless generation, this is the rebuke. O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? O how long shall I suffer you bring him unto me? And they brought him unto him. When he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked the father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said of a child. Now, beloved, I want you to crawl into this man's life for just a second. I want you to step into his shoes. Here is this child, this son of this father that has brought him uh, to the disciples to rid him of this evil spirit or this issue that has been dealing and cursing his life all of his, all of his days. The son of this man presents, uh, uh, presents his child who's held in bond, is locked away by an intruder of another man's family, if you will. I mean, what a picture of the world today. What a picture of the struggles that we see today. We see this boy visibly incarcerated, unable to control himself. We see him uh, at the mere mercy of this wicked spirit dwelling inside of him. But guys, listen, we're, we're living in a world today where so many are held in the midst of bondage. They're held in the midst of, of, of bondage from this world. And they're deceiving themselves. Even those that name the name of Christ today, right here, right now, are in some type of battle somewhere in their days uh, that's away in secret sins that are plaguing the life of Christians every single day. Sins that cause them insecurity. Sins that cause them paranoia. There are men tonight that are suffering from the secret sin of God bitterness, of which is causing them to pineth away, if you will. You become stiffened and hardened toward the movement of the Holy Spirit of God and have succumbed to relying on a synthesized movement to the Spirit of God. And that, that's why we have such a contemporary movement in the world today. That's why we have uh, such a movement that wants to get people shaking uh, to sounds rather than the Spirit of God. Now, I'm not against lively music. You understand that. I like that opening song we sang today. I was tell, talking to Sister Daisy. And, I said, that's kind of a chirpy song, and I kind of like that, amen. I'm not against, listen, I don't think church needs to be a funeral, amen. Have the funeral at home, amen. amen. Have the funeral at your house, die to self like we heard this morning, come to church, serve God, worship Him, Spirit, truth, and have a good time, amen. People ought not come to church and, and look like they just lost their best friend, amen. And we see it all the time. I mean, you know, there's churches that I've preached in before, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm certain that, that half the pews said at, said at the church that morning, or said at home that morning, I dare that guy to bless me. He ain't going to do it. I'm going to hold off. Amen. Well, you're right. I can't bless you if you don't want to be a blessing. Amen. I can't bless you at all. You come to church looking for a blessing. It doesn't matter if the house is full, the house is empty, you'll find one. Listen, there's been many times in this building right here by myself. I've got a blessing of God and I'm just by myself, just alone. I come down here to the altar, I pray, I'll shout for joy. If God wants me to shout for joy, I'll have a little bit of excitement. I'll have a little bit of a fit if I want to, then I'll leave, amen. That's just the way it is, praise God. And you say, well, you're a preacher. Yeah, I am. And that's what happens, amen. We have, listen, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to do my best to enjoy what God has given me. Some people, they need other stuff to help them. Beloved, I want to tell you tonight that what we need, the people, if we're not careful, we're going to watch the world today uh, being taken captive, taken captive uh, by the will of Satan tonight. The answer of them is to cast it aside. Whatever may be holding us back, whatever may be in his present in our life, whatever is holding us or hindering us, whether it be bitterness or whether it be a stiffened neck or whether it be pain or somebody hurt you 25 years ago or whatever it may be, we've got to cast it aside. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, he said, casting down imaginations. Now, the word imaginations mean the creation of images. The creation of images in your mind. When the Lord looked down, he was sickened by the generation of, of Noah's day. He says that they're imagining, they imagine the faults of their hearts. The imaginations were evil continually. They had the creation of wicked, vile images in their mind, in their being, in their heart all the time. They had given themselves over to wickedness. Paul says casting those things down. 
And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I gave you Proverbs 14, 14 uh, last week. Praise God, I turned right to it. Uh, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from uh, himself. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. What is the true test tonight? of a person that is backslid away from the Lord Jesus Christ is that they have more thoughts about their selves, themselves than they do about God. That's the true test. We think that somebody's got to be a drunken bum to be backslid. We think somebody has to uh, go around cursing. All of those things are evidence, but they're just byproducts of what is inside of a man's thoughts, inside of a man's hearts. If you're thinking more of yourself than you are of God, that's the evidence, true evidence of being backslid. And Paul says we've got to cast them down. We've got a sure problem here. We have a son possessed and, you know, granted this, fa this father here, granted one of these scribes, granted he is uh, he, he's, he's, he's uh, uh, berating probably the disciples because they couldn't do what they were supposed to be able to do. But step in his shoes for just a moment. You think he was heartbroken? Oh, don't you think that his heart broke every time he saw that child thrown down into the water or thrown down in the fire? Or that child foaming because of a foul spirit, a wicked spirit? Don't you think that was true? Oh, I'll guarantee it, man. This poor soul, he, he, he was but a child. He couldn't help it. He was but a child where the devil has made his home simply because he could. And the disciples... The disciples couldn't do anything. So here's what we know for sure tonight, without a shadow of a doubt. We know that there's a sure problem. The disciples couldn't do their job. We know there's a poor son possessed who had, hey, listen, man, I, we, we don't know anything about this child. It's not his fault. This child may have been, been a victim of circumstance. I, I don't know. I have no idea. Maybe it was the dad's fault. I don't know. But I know he's possessed of a devil. And by being possessed of the devil, there's a third thing that we know. This is what we know for absolute positive fact. We know there is Satan's presence. Look in verse 20 with me. Verse 20 of Mark chapter 9. The Bible tells me in verse 20, it says, And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, now watch this, guys. Now read this for what the words say. Don't worry about what it means. There's no secret meaning here. There's no uh, secret decoder ring. Just read what it says. Straightway the Spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked the Father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? At the forefront of this issue, at the forefront of this issue is a foul spirit. One of the vile creatures sanctioned to harm mankind and all that God stands for. But in the backdrop, the puppet master, if you will, the strength, the seat, the authority behind this foul spirit, providing the power, is the one who proclaimed in his final statement in the third heaven, I will be like the Most High, Isaiah 14. It's Satan there. Just like he was at Calvary, just like he was in the garden, just like he, he was in the wilderness, just like he was when he took Christ up in the, in the high uh, mountain, just like he, uh, uh, just like he is, is everywhere that there can be. He can't be in two places at one time, but he can be in two places pretty quickly, amen? And all of his little hensions and all of these things. They, they cater to the fact that he is the power behind. And beloved, this is not a justification of, well, the devil made me do it. But see, we, we've, we, we, people have used the fact that the devil made me do it, they've used that excuse so long, this imbalanced life, the other people have swung it so far over here that, hey, you know what? They just don't even acknowledge that there's a devil. I've had conversation after conversation with individuals who say because they don't like what this group is doing and this group is always blaming the devil that they're over here saying, well, it's not the devil ever. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now. For us to think that there is no devil in this world is for us to visibly, for us to, to uh, just purposely deny the Holy Scriptures and to stick our head in the sand. Amen. I mean, why not just crawl up in the fetal position and say, wave the white flag and say, I quit. There's a devil out there. He's wicked. The Bible says he's our adversary. 
The Bible says that, that uh, as your adversary the devil walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You know who he's going to devour? That, that one that says there's no devil. Amen. Mm -hmm. Satan's presence is there. We need to acknowledge that fact. We need to understand that our battles are really not in the flesh. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness, against principalities and powers, against spiritual darkness, darkness that is in the high places. And this poor child here has been taken advantage of. This poor child here uh, has been torn. Now notice that in this words. I want you to see this with me as we go into our closing thought tonight. I want you to see when Christ, hey listen, when that spirit came out of him, the Bible says the spirit tear him. He opened him up. He injured him. So we have a child here because of the fact of Satan's presence we have a sure problem. The disciples didn't do what they could. We have a son possessed. We have the Satan's presence. But praise God tonight. And not only here in Mark chapter 9, but in the 14th of August, 2016, we have a Savior's power. The rest of verse 22, we says, And oftentimes he had cast him into uh, the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe in the straightway the Father. The Father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. The power of the Lord Jesus Christ is never to be questioned, my friend. I want you to notice with me in, the word, in, in verse 22. Notice two words with me, if you will, real quick. You see the word if, and you see the word anything. By the father of the child, quickly, uh, uh, by the father of the child, who says, if and anything, quickly is addressed in verse 23. Look at this. Jesus Christ quickly addresses his statement. If thou canst believe, all things are possible in him that believeth. You see, beloved, the page is turned by the Lord. The father is saying, look, if you can do anything, it's not a question of whether or not the Lord can do something. It's a question of whether or not we believe that he will do something. Amen. We're never to question the Lord's power, but rather we can question our own belief, but never His power. Amen. Can I tell you that His power, number one, is absolute? Verse 25 in the first verse says, And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, He rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto Him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of Him, and enter no more into Him. Not only is His power absolute, but His power is authoritative. Do you notice the boundaries that Jesus Christ put into this foul spirit? Not only did He have the power to cast this foul spirit out of Him, but He told Him, and don't come back, amen. He said, don't come back here anymore. So He has absolute power. He has an authoritative power. But bless God tonight that He has an awakening power. Verse 27 says, But Jesus took Him by the hand and lifted Him up, and He arose. Here we have a devil that attempted to achieve a last-ditch effort to inflict harm on this child, to inflict harm on this family, to hurt this child. And all the Lord Jesus Christ did was reach down and grab him by the hand, and everything that that devil had done all his life was completely 100% overruled in one quick moment. Beloved, this is the power that the Lord Jesus Christ has. This is the power that Jesus Christ has for all of us who will believe on Him, in Him, and through Him for our daily life. He is the foundation of this event. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.11, uh, For other foundation can no man lay, and that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. His power is not to be questioned. It is the crucial ingredient of which our faith is built upon, the faith of Jesus Christ. Faith is the key to Christ's power to be in our life. And it does not make, our faith doesn't make, power, make Christ's power any stronger, but it makes it more possible in our life. So, beloved, I just want to give you this thought tonight. I'm done. If we have that one thing in our life, and every one of us in here knows what that one thing is, there's one thing in our life, in our homes, in our marriages, in our businesses, in our work, in our walk, there's one thing in our life that is keeping us from having full faith in God's power to be exercised in our life. One thing. And that, even though that thing is not throwing you down and casting you in the water and casting you in the fire, even though you're not seeing those things happen, that one thing is keeping you
from having the power of Christ in your life that we need. So beloved, I'm asking you this here this evening. Are you where you need to be with God Almighty, the Creator of the world? Take this thought and then we'll go to prayer. Jesus Christ came down from revealing Himself in His glorified state. He came down to a situation of what normally would have looked like failure. He intervened in a great way. He asked a few questions here or there. He turned the table for the Father. But at the end of the day, that Son got the victory. He got the victory because that Father said, Help thou mine unbelief. That father may have said to Christ and questioned his power initially. But the Lord turned the tables on him and said, it's not up to me, it's up to you. So maybe you're here tonight and you're struggling with something. Maybe you're here tonight and you, there's just that one thing that's keeping you from being where you need to be. Maybe you're here tonight and you need to get saved. Maybe you need to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the one thing. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. That's how simple salvation is this evening. And really and truly, that's how simple the solution to all of our issues in this life tonight. That's where they lie. If you believe. Our belief doesn't make Christ's power any stronger. Keep in mind, He spoke the worlds into existence. He spoke creation into existence. And the very one tonight that spoke everything that is into creation is the very one presenting to every one of us here this evening. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. So do you believe tonight? Do you believe? Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. For who and what you are, we thank you for the many blessings you've given us. Pray that you take your word this evening. Pray that you uh, just bring to fruition in people's life. Pray that glory and honor and praise will be brought to your name. We just ask you to see you, Lord, make a difference in the lives of everyone that is present, everyone that has heard this message. Pray you bless us, Lord. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we ask all of this. Amen. Amen. Well, as always.